All right. Well, thanks every, uh, everybody for coming. Um, uh, I wrote a book called, called Wanted, A Spiritual Pursuit Through Jail Among Outlaws and Across Borders. And uh, the basic story is that I came up from Southern California uh, to the Skagit Valley 10 years ago. And I wasn't looking to change the world. I wasn't looking to change systems. Uh, I had those ideas. I went to Berkeley along, along the way. But while I was uh, at Berkeley and um, studying everything so from sociology of poverty to nonviolent social change, art history, Russian literature, I was also suicidal. Uh, and I couldn't really get out of my own uh, inadequacies. And I, so I kind of my, uh, so many of my fellow peers were headed off to um, Fulbright, Fulbright grants and cool summer internships and getting uh, uh, internships in, in Washington, D.C. and starting nonprofit organizations. And, and I was just kind of lost reading Dostoevsky in my room, fantasizing of not waking up again, um, and uh, feeling completely useless to the world. And I wanted to join the Jesus movement of what I saw in the Gospels. I'd grown up over church. You, you put a kid in, the, in a church environment growing up, you just their, their head gets saturated with the Jesus stuff. And, um, but if you don't see how then to go out the door and go do it, where would the tax collectors and prostitutes be in our time? Where are the miracles and people chained up on the edge of town? Where are people being resurrected? If you don't see that, it just goes sour. And I think a lot of people either go to divinity school or they become atheists who grew up in the church. They either want to press deeper into the text and say, what the hell is this? Is this, is this really something worth my life, as I've been told over and over and over on Sunday, or I'm done? But because I'm not, oftentimes we're not seeing it. I didn't see it, but I wanted to. I wanted to study theology, but I'd already been in the academy. I wanted to get back to the streets with people who were as, as lonely and messed up as me because I felt intimidated around other college students and divinity students because they were so much more capable than me. They were still, I don't know, not fantasizing about ending their lives. They were like turning in their papers. Um, but I felt really close to folks who were homeless. And so when I felt left out of the parties on Friday nights, I'd hang out in the park with folks in their shopping carts. And um, I could bring them some coffee so I didn't feel completely useless. And I felt some amount of kinship sitting under the trees. But I heard about a guy, uh, barely graduated, and I heard about a guy uh, named Bob Eckblad up in the far northwest corner of the country who had been a liberation theologian and agrarian activist in Latin America in the 80s when I was born. So he had done the stuff that was like, really cool and what I was primed to, to celebrate and participate with. And he had gone to France for a theological education after starting this grassroots Bible study movement in Mount Sfondaris. He'd gone to France because he didn't trust American institutions, so he had this awesome leftist politic. And then after his uh, education in, in France, he came to the far northwest corner of the country to be a chaplain in a, in a county jail and, and a pastor to undocumented migrant farm workers out in the camps, in the migrant farm worker camps. And he was writing a book called Reading the Bible with the Damned. It was written for seminary students. Mm -hmm. It was like, what is the exegesis and hermeneutics of being dialogically involved with folks on the margins to read the scriptures together, looking for a theology of good news. But in, in, in the liberation theology sense, like him coming from a place of privilege, not presuming to know what that is, but facilitating an encounter between those who are on the margins and the, and the, and the scriptures. Um, so I went and I walked into this small county jail in the Northwest. Uh, never th had uh, dreams of doing jail stuff or chaplaincy stuff. Um, and sitting in this room in, in plastic chairs in a circle with uh, all sorts of races, Mexican gang members, old gnarly biker types, migrant farm workers, uh, folks from the reservations, uh, some of the native peoples in the Northwest, reading the scriptures together kind of became my church where I felt kind of free for the first time. And it was especially the young gang members that I really clicked with. These were young men who also resented the world and its systems, but felt powerless to change them, and were living out a kind of suicidal angst in ways a little bit differently than me. But they started inviting me to visit them one-on-one -on -one in the one-on-one -on -one, uh, visitation cells and calling me their pastor after a while. And for me, that was still a bad word. And we'd grown up in all those evangelical churches growing up. I thought they were making fun of me. I thought they were like, hey, it's the, it's the dorky religious guy, everybody. And, and I'd say, oh, don't, don't call me a pastor. I just, I, I don't know what I wanted to be. I liked the idea maybe of grassroots activist theologian. That would be my fantasy. But they're like, no, you're a pastor, dog. And we never had one. They said it was like, like it was a good thing. And so for the, the next 10 years, I've been trying to figure out how to be a gang pastor. And the, well, the first thing I had to learn was 
uh, or th that I had to kind of reappropriate the word pastor in a way that made sense to me, that wasn't just like the CEO of a religious social club that had to keep programs and servants and ser services running. Um, but a pastor is, in Spanish, it's a, a pastor is a shepherd. And shepherds, they don't always smell good. They're hidden off in the, the margins and the places in the hills and in the valleys. And they spend a lot of time with the sheep. And they're not a really respectable or powerful role in society. And so um, I started to kind of like and embrace the word pastor again, of what it is, what is it, what is it to be pastor of the society's black sheep, if you will. And so towards the end of those years, I started writing, but not theology. I was about to go to divinity school. Um, and something in me just took a hard left turn at the last minute, and I, took, I enrolled in an MFA program. And so I still can't get ordained. I still can't get a good job at a, at a, at a divinity school or a university. But, but I wrote uh, a lot about some of the darkness out there in theology more in a narrative style. And so that's what I want to share with you guys today. I've got a few portions to just read to you, more like a reading than a lecture. Um, and then we'll, we'll crack it open with some Q&A. Sound good? All right. Is that okay if I don't do the podium? Is it, is it for taping purposes, is that okay? If there's the light not right in my face, that's all right? Awesome. Let me read to you just a few sentences from the intro to kind of frame what, what is this book? Because we're in a graduate school and there's books everywhere. And everyone's deciding, am I going to read that or am I just going to like skim it or am I just going to look at the Amazon summary? This is what this book is. With these stories of wanted men, my relationships with criminalized individuals and various states of transformation, I'm really trying to capture a greater subject, a divine presence one that has yet to be held very long in any official custody. These pages, a mix of true crime and spiritual adventure, can be read as a story. It would be the story of my ongoing pursuit of this presence among the unwanted characters I've met in the small county jail where I moonlight as a chaplain now. It would be the story mostly about my friendships with young gang members set in a misty agricultural valley in the far northwest and with one particular thief running through it all. You'll hear about him in a little bit, ducking in and out of the chapters. But other than a story, I'd rather think of these chapters as forensic sketches, if you will, a kind of mystical portraiture across time, varying in color, material, tone, and size. That is, after 10 years moving in and out of the jail as an uncredentialed minister, learning to pray in a cathedral of tattoos and temporary release orders, these stories are my versions of the painter Rothko's answer to what he was painting. I'm trying to paint God. And like Rothko's paintings, these chapters may look at first nothing at all like God, full of unsavory criminals, lots of profanity, violence, death, and drugs. But I invite you to look more closely, to lean in and allow an image of God to surprise you and a presence maybe to sneak up on you. And as with all wanted posters, with outlaws, I've sketched these portraits because this presence has escaped me in recent years. And the purpose of wanted posters is to alert the public. My hope is that these portraits might raise your awareness of what could be just outside your door, outside your books, still alive, slipping through the shadows on the edge of your county or your heart. All the events I describe happened. Dialogue is rendered as best as I can remember it. Significant portions often scribbled in my journals soon after conversations. But overall, I confess that these portraits are shaped less by a journalist's sensibility and more by the images that continue to haunt me throughout the day and sometimes into the night. I haven't gotten it right, but I keep trying to find a shape for this presence that is still at large. I leave my doors unlocked. So let me just start with the first story about that thief running through this all. It's a, the title story called Wanted, and I've broken it up into nine portions, and he kind of shows up uh, like a recurring character throughout the chapters. So this is the main kind of spinal arc of the book, Wanted, part one. Someone called the cops on Ricardo Mejia as soon as he was born. As soon as his 15-year-old mother had finished ridding him from her body, she slipped out of the Skagit Valley Hospital and left him there. When the nurse came in and saw the squirming newborn on his own in the clear plastic bin, she made no move to pick him up or cradle him. 
Instead, she picked up the phone and called the police. Richard, his family called him, could remember sitting in court when the state tried to force his mother to claim him. Many children suffer through watching their parents fight, and many others endure the anxiety of knowing those fights are the result of custody battles. But seated on a wooden bench behind the lawyers, his small feet not yet reaching the floor, little Richard looked on as representatives of the state fought with his mother for the opposite reason. Neither party wanted him. Sometimes the state won, and her begrudging hand would lead him out the courtroom door, but just as often the small boy watched his mother walk out of court without him, her eyes avoiding his. So years later, Richard could hardly contain his delight when a helicopter and multiple squad cars chased him at high speeds through neighborhoods and down farm roads. The thrill of so many people laboring to keep him in their sights, sparing no cost to get their hands on him. As he swung the stolen sedan around corners of potato fields and long rows of beets, Richard shot his twitching, open-jawed gaze past one young woman in his front seat and another in the back and saw, through the rear window, how the squad cars would not give up on him. Richard had been burglarizing a house with these new partners when the police spotted them and the hunt began. Richard managed to prolong this waking dream, search parties in hot pursuit of him for three days, disappearing each evening. Being invisible was, after all, the state he knew best. The afternoon of his first escape from the chase, Richard veered the small Honda into tall fields of corn, plowing his own harvest maze of sorts. On hands and knees and alone, he disappeared into the field like a treasure to be hunted. When a young woman flipped on the hanging light bulb in her small laundry basement that night, she saw a skinny, half-white, half-Mexican-looking young man with a shaved head crouched in the corner, smiling back at her, holding a tattooed finger to his lips. Methamphetamines had sucked his face into a near skull, but the gleam in his deep-set eyes above his high cheeks still had the effect of a child's disarming grin. Each night he was at large, Richard made new friends in this way. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, they joined the pursuit on day two, their canine units sniffing through torn down trailer parks where he was believed to be hiding. The photos of these perplexed officers and German shepherds on long leashes covered the front page of the following morning's Skagit Valley Herald, right next to Richard's mugshot from a past arrest. The article stated that Richard, at 23, had joined the official list of Washington State's most wanted. The officers found Richard hiding atop a storage container behind the Walmart in Mount Vernon, between the dumpsters. They did not immediately lay hands on him. Instead, they tasered him. Fourteen times, he remembered. Later, press accounts said only six. Richard said that after cuffing him to a bedpost hours later, the exhausted lead investigator confessed to him, scraped and bruised, that he'd never had such difficulty tracking down a suspect on these streets before. Normally, the detective told him he could get any drug addict to rat out another by offering a small fold of cash. The search would be over in hours. This time, he told Richard, he went to all the houses, offered hundreds of dollars, but no one would say a word. All denied knowing Richard. I gotta hand it to you, Mr. Mejia. Richard remembered the man with a badge on his belt saying to him while wiping his forehead, you got a lot of respect out there on the streets. This made Richard smile. It didn't surprise him. Because unlike most thieves and addicts, whenever Richard scored some drugs, he called everyone he knew to share the cash he'd found with them. Richard liked being surrounded. He often threw the only kind of feast he knew in order to gather a willing fellowship. Those who came, who accepted his invitation, were, of course, other often unhealthy, drug-addicted souls in the criminal shadows. While the motives in these affairs are as mixed and deceptive as the baggies of various white powders they exchange, an addict goes with what's available. There is, in these desperate relationships, as with cut drugs, enough of the pure to get one through the night. Early in his thieving career, Richard gained the attention of local gangs. See, the alienated children of migrant farm workers adrift in rural white counties band together in this way. And so agricultural valleys like ours become ganglands that can rival those of the biggest cities. These gangs wanted Richard, so he joined them. They liked his pluck, and they gave him a new name. They called him Little Jokes. When he was in need in the middle of the night, they'd pick him up. They would never call the cops on him. 
He tattooed the barrio's name and symbols on his neck and his chest, behind his ear, next to the names of women who were able to love him for short periods of time. He gave his gang everything he had. He did what they told him to do and more. But what the detective confessed to Richard, who sat handcuffed to the bed, was evidence of something that transcended these normal street allegiances. It was proof that Richard was special. Whether or not those people standing behind cracked open front doors lying to police officers loved him in the truest sense or not, it was certain that they at least felt a tenderness, a protectiveness, something like respect for this wounded, flailing, and uniquely unguarded young man tearing through their blurred lives. The first night I met Richard in jail, I was losing the attention of men in the circle of chairs at Bible study. Hey guys, check this out. I was trying to pull us together. Guys, guys, check this out. Richard, new to our group, he sat just to my left. He spun on me from his laughter with two other inmates, and he pointed his finger right at my face, his head cocked. No, bro, how about you check this out? What he then began to aggressively throw at me from his life, from his opinions, was so good, I started taking notes. He monologued about the streets, about being slave to a needle, about misery, betrayal, being hated, being tasered on the ground while multiple officers stood around him with dogs. It didn't feel like he was trying to show defiance or silence me for cheap attention. Instead, in that first jail meeting, he countered my flailing Bible study by filling the remaining time with a more generous and more robust offering from his own story. When he saw me taking notes, asking him to slow down, repeat a few phrases, Richard smiled. The multi-purpose room cl door clanged open and a guard stepped in to announce, it's time. All the inmates stood up to go back to their cells, but Richard leaned in close and looked me in the eye. Hey, come visit me this week. I'm serious. When I visited Richard one-on-one -on -one a week later, in a cramped cinder block cell, sitting on a hard chair, facing him across a bare table, he said he wanted to offer me something. If you're gonna know me, he began, I don't wanna hide shit. Richard told me about a home video he'd taken of himself. This was his most treasured possession, he said, and he wanted me to have it. I was confused as to why I deserved such a gift so suddenly. See, I was high out of my mind a few weeks ago when I made it, he said. I'm not gonna lie, but one night I almost cried over how fucked up my life is, and I decided I'm gonna videotape this a day in my fucked up life. It turned into three days, dog. It's full of shit. I don't want just anyone seeing, you know. But I want you to go to my mom's house and tell her I sent you, okay? She knows where I hid the camera and tape. Her name's April. She's not my real mom, you know, but she's the only mom I ever had. To me, she's my mom. But watch that video, I'm telling you, Chris. I never saw the raw footage of those days in Richard's uncensored life. When I called the number, he wrote down in large cartoonish numbers in my journal, I learned that whatever passed for the record of his existence had already been thrown away burned and buried in the backyard. Too much evidence against him, Rachel told me. I'm sorry, April told me. So I tried to imagine Richard carrying around his stolen camcorder, pointing it at himself, the blinking red dot, proof of its steady gaze, the undivided attention it paid to him. It would follow him. It would listen. It would not interrupt, nor scold, nor judge. It would be there. It would remember him, everything he said. He would put on no performance, feign no smiling introduction before the lens. Richard didn't want that. He took the electronic witness along with him into his places of shame, his hours of boredom, his hibernating, then running routine of addiction and theft, the camera capturing all the unhappy people with unhappy words in unhappy homes where he crashed. I knew the portrait had been destroyed, but still, I wanted it. That's the end of the first part of Richard's story, and it continues through, throughout the book. Normally we save Q&A for the end, but um, it's, we, can, we can make it more kind of chatty in between. I'm going to read one more longer selection. We can chat more, but any questions, comments before we continue? Welcome. We're all introducing ourselves. What's your name? Martha. Hi, Martha. What, brung, what brings you here today? Uh, I'm a graduate twice of Vanderbilt. I got a BA in 74 and a PhD in 2002. Yeah? <laughs> Glad you're here. Uh -huh. Are you here for the whole conference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, it took me a while to find you. 
Find a place to park. Us too. We got here late. And then to find, to, I, I didn't know what, there wasn't an art room when I was here. This is the art room. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyone else who, who came in a little bit late and missed introductions? Andrew. Andrew? What brings you here today, Andrew? Oh, you and conference. Cool. We're staying at Andrew and Lindsay's place. Oh. And Andrew, you're presenting tomorrow in the conference as well, right? You want to make a plug for it? There's lots of good things to do. <laughs> oh. I don't want to play so loud. Okay. Cool. Yeah. How old is Richard? Him here. At that point in the story, he's 23 years old, mm -hmm. when he was arrested on the run and was named uh, one of uh, Washington State's most wanted. Should we keep rolling? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Brad. I'm, I came here too. So. Brad, glad you came. What? Are you here for the conference? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, welcome to the pre-party. <laughs> I'm reading from a book called Wanted: <laughs> A Spiritual Pursuit Through Jail, <laughs> Among Outlaws, and Across Borders. And I'm, I'm a j uh, chaplain, un un unordained still, at a small county jail up there. And over the last 10 years, I've kind of become an informal pastor of largely gang members. And so this is, as I was describing in the introduction, is not so much um, a, a theological manifesto um, or like how to, st how to work with gang members, but trying to much more, I guess it's nice that we're in the art room in the Divinity School, is inspired by painters such as Rothko, trying to capture a very elusive presence of God that's hard to name, and even to pin down with footnotes theologically, but one that I've sensed in pastoral movement on the fringes of society and in places I didn't suspect. I'm trying to tell those stories. All right, well, I'm gonna read now uh, a chapter called No Contact uh, that began as a, a very, sm does anyone read The Sun magazine? I don't, oh man, read The Sun magazine. It's one of the most beautiful literary magazines out there. They have a little section called the Reader's Write, where anyone can submit something to, to a prompt that's only like one to three hundred words. So it's some, some of the best stories of people that don't, don't write long essays. Um, and, and I submitted one about a little portion of the story. And then uh, it was really nice because the first time we did that, I got an email from someone at uh, NPR's program, Snap Judgment, and they wanted to turn it into a show. And then we did a second, a third, and a fourth. And then, um, so it was like on NPR, and then someone at 700 Club, opposite end of the kind of political <laughs> spectrum, picked it up as well. And they wanted to do a story as well on this. And so after these stories were going, I thought, I need to write this down. And so it became a written chapter last, after it became a story we told. No contact. Most of the crimes I hear about from the men I meet in the jail, they don't alarm me, even the murders. To threaten, steal, destroy, cheat, evade, rage, attack, smother, and self-medicate. They're all impulses I recognize in myself. Most men who come to our Bible studies, then I can welcome as tragic extensions of my own hypothetical selves. And these men in rubber slippers are frankly more honest about their sins than I am about the distortion I can hide within myself. So to visit and to embrace these men is really to see and embrace my own darkness. So I've often considered the jail a kind of warped existential mirror. People on the outside, though, people I meet at loud bars or backyard barbecues, when they learned I spend my time as a volunteer chaplain among locked up criminalized people, often say things like, that must be scary. And they say it in an honoring way, as if I had the virtue of courage. I usually can't help but smile when someone projects such fearlessness onto me because I'm full of fears. I panic like a little kid, for instance, when I feel lost or alone, or my GPS not working in Vanderbilt and fearing being late to a meeting. In a forest at dusk, alone, or a big city without a friend, or in my study at home with my head in my hands. This, I tell them, is possibly why I go to the jail so often. I find myself less alone among other anxious men there. Growing up in many churches, I never found them to be raw or extremely honest places not places where you could show the worst side of yourself. But I found the jail to be a place where inmates didn't have the option to hide their problems. Hard as one may try with weak laughter or macho fronts before guards, you can't pretend your life is working out just fine when you're locked in a county jail. Here people are left staring, innocent or guilty of the specific charges, at the wreck of their lives. And in this place, in these rooms of unadorned life, I found something 
that I think clergy call sacrament, mysteries I could feel. More than the Bible studies, the one-on-one -on -one visits with the men were the sites of holy encounters for me. The holding cells up near the front desk, closet-sized, small, had walls of whitewashed cinder blocks. Many of these men who invited me to visit them didn't have family show up on Saturday's normal visiting hours. So when the officer would bring one of the men up front whom I'm asked for, from the growing list I'd keep inside the front page of my journal, many of them would wait until the door was shut, sure that the officer had turned away, before collapsing out of a hard posture and into a surprisingly vulnerable embrace that often caught me off guard. Others, though, didn't care what the officer saw and shouted affectionate greetings. Hell yeah, what's up, Chris, you came! As they strutted down the hall, held between two armed escorts. Maybe they'd expected just a lawyer. Most of the time, as well, we hardly knew each other. Maybe we'd had one visit before this, and this is how they greeted and welcomed me. We'd sit down at the little lawyer's table. Between us, though, it functioned more like an altar. Young tattooed men would lay their ink-storied heads on it, They'd often weep. Everything they held to themselves, burdens of pain, stashes of truth, could be emptied. They would open their hands on the narrow table, vulnerably asking for something invisible, yet waiting for my hands at the same time, before prayer. I was always surprised at how reticent they were to let go of them, even to wipe their own noses. As they ventured simple prayers, crying, holding my hands, many times I saw long, clear ointment slowly extend from their nose, from their eyes and chin to their laps or on the dry table between us. On more than one occasion, I remember young Chicano gangsters tattooed fists not letting go of my own after an initial prayer, keeping an intense, unashamed, sweaty grip as we spoke face to face for the next 30 minutes or more. I never felt a need to slide out of that grip. Some nights, we would simply sit together in the stillness like this. We try to listen the way monks and mystics listen in prayer. Because it was easier when we were together, not alone, in this quiet cell. These men were giving me the riches of their lives in this small space, and they didn't know it. What they had been trying to trash or avoid, their feelings, their pasts, their stories, their tears especially, and confessions and secret fragile dreams, they were to me the precious material of psalms, of prayers, and of poems. It was also the stuff of friendship, and they offered more of that, connecting me to their friends. They'd say, hey, if it's all right with you, I want to cut this visit short so you can visit with my Sally. He never comes to these Bible studies, but he'd be down with this right here. Or, hey, when I get out, can I call you? There's someone I really want you to meet. And so the fellowship grew, communion expanded, and contact increased. Even in group studies, our gatherings became more than Bible study. Many of the most fiercely postured men would begin to whimper as Bob, our pastor, slowly circled around the inmates, respectfully laying his hands gently on their shoulders, one by one, whispering blessings none of us could hear as I played soft music on the beat-up old classical guitar I'd found at our ministry building. Sometimes they would weep uncontrollably, these men starved of kindness and care. I felt like I was falling deeper in love as all this happened. It wasn't just with the broken lives at the table with me. I think it was love for the one through whose eyes I was possibly learning to see. I began to suspect I was sensing the desire of another, God's desire for the locked up. It was for this direct spiritual contact that I came so many nights a week, excusing myself early from dinners with friends, missing movies and participation in evening soccer leagues, I came to the jail to keep the connection. Guys would ask me about my own life in our one-on-one -on -one visits, and I could confess my own private issues, and they would not judge me. I could smile and whisper my latest good news, like when I met my wife Rachel for the first time and took her out, or when I recorded a new song I'd written and liked. And I could share my most unrefined questions about God, uncensored, and they wouldn't drill me. It was safe. Going to the jail most nights didn't feel like altruism, charity, volunteer work, organizing, social justice, obedience, or any of those labels I'd been told motivated acts of service to others in hard places. It was more like a seed finding soil and then light. But 
One evening, a few years in, the guards at the front desk informed us chaplains that a new policy was in place, a no-touch policy. This policy was shared by most correctional facilities in the nation, and our little jail, I was told, was finally catching up. No longer could we have any physical contact with the inmates. This included the thousands of hugs men came to expect in our gatherings. Some confessed they came to our Bible studies for that embrace alone. When the door opened to our multi-purpose room, they'd be lined up, several guys opening their arms for one hug after another. Men I'd never met would say, I get a hug too. And these were hard dudes. Grizzly old men with beards, biker types, gangster types. And they all wanted hugs. Some would just say, just came to get my fix, man. But with the new policy, all of this was now off limits. This included the regular huddle with the men when they'd come in close together at the end of our group and put their arms around each other. It always struck me as something rare, a chain linking every race and age and offense in the facility. Sometimes each guy would lay a hand, or both, on someone in the middle of the chairs who was in pain and had asked for prayer. All these men reaching in with one hand like petals of some ragged flower. In the center of it was one vulnerable man sobbing or silent in the one safe place inside this world of emotional lockdown, a spiritual shelter where he could receive such healthy contact and grace from everyone else, including fellow inmates, with guards watching on through the mirrored window. Now that was all taken away, everything except a professional handshake upon greeting. That day, the facility became a darker place. It seemed like men slowly were becoming more violent. We heard of more fights breaking out, the men, I imagine, swinging fiercely for some kind of contact. More clampdown measures were installed. Bob and I were instructed as chaplains to bluntly turn down any advance from any inmate for any kind of embrace. The guards, after all, would be watching us through the mirrored windows, and we could lose all visiting access if we were found in violation. So when the men threw their arms open to us, upon coming out of their cells and into the room where we'd met for Bible studies in the past. Men we missed, whom we hadn't seen for months sometimes. We had to pinch off our theology and our affection, twisting our torsos away from these men. It was awkward, seizing back like that, our bodies communicating that they were untouchable before our words could clarify about this new policy. There was nothing I could say that could take this new, sad, confused look out of their eyes. The one-on-one -on -one visits were even worse. No longer could we meet in those private cells across the table. Security concerns, they told us. Too many things could be passed between the chaplain and the inmate. Contraband. Now we had to meet in the long row of public visiting stalls. We'd sit with a pane of thick glass between us. Instead of hugging, we'd wave, smile, nod, point, mouth exaggerated words. They'd pick up a phone, dial in their inmate identification code through the loud beeping tone. I'd pick up a phone on my side. Hey, much of the time we still couldn't hear each other. Phone's not working. We'd mime. But even when they did work, everything we said was now taped, digitally available to their prosecutors. Their crimes, their pasts, their emotions, even the tones of their voices, anything we wanted to talk about, it could be used against them. The confessional booth was tapped. There were no more tears in these visits. With the glass, all was sealed up. Now the men would always have to insist on their innocence even when looking me in the eye. When hearts don't have a place to break, they become harder. I watched them become harder. Goodbyes came sooner. The shorter visits no longer ended with laughter, no catharsis where something deep inside the men emerged and blossomed between us, no wiping their eyes on the sleeves of their red scrubs. These visits now ended with a limp, unfelt knuckle bump against the bulletproof glass. Later, doors would open automatically and they would go back to passing in and out of their confined spaces, passing each other on schedule, keeping their composure. The pane of glass was everywhere. That's the point, after all, the purpose of a no-contact order, formerly known as a court-enforced restraining order, that more walls of protection might extend throughout the community, invisible panes, protecting us from specific people. For better or for worse, these walls are multiplying in our communities. One of the guys, Neeners, kept in touch with me over the next few years. 
after he went to prison, after he was shipped off and ended up in solitary confinement. I drove long hours over the Cascade Mountains, across the high Washington Desert Plateau, and waited on my side of the glass while guards uncuffed him on the other side. I was worried, because what he began to tell me in his letters confirmed what I'd been learning in those documentaries I'd been watching on solitary confinement. Guys lose their minds in here, he wrote. There's truly no contact. It wasn't just prayer or hugs taken away as in the county jail. He was alone in a roughly nine by six room, 23 hours a day. He'd have panic attacks and trouble breathing. Visits in solitary confinement happened in a small booth with extra thick plexiglass between us and a dated and crackling intercom system through which to speak. Years of lettering and designs had been scratched into the glass on both sides, adding, to a, hazy film, adding a hazy film to the distance between us. One of the things he asked me in our letters was, hey, bro, can you help me build a relationship with my daughters? They don't know me. One of them, she's just five. Can you go build trust with her mom and bring our daughter to come visit me? She's never even seen me. So I did that. I found her, drafted, signed, and notarized paperwork between her mother and the prison system, giving me permission to carry Nina's daughter, Adelita, across this chasm between them. She and I got in the car, drove six hours across the state, and I thought, man, he's in for a treat to meet this amazing little girl, his daughter. She was chatting me up the whole time from the back seat, singing songs before she'd fall asleep against the seatbelt. Because, you know, little kids can't ride in front. I would practice with her, slowly teaching songs she'd never heard, like, You Are My Sunshine. She loved this one, but she could never remember the words. So we sang it over and over through the rearview mirror. We pulled into the prison. I carried her through the metal detector. The next automatic door opened. This little girl in pigtails and red stockings and patent leather shoes was clipping along the tile floor with me, holding my hand deeper into the cold, solitary confinement wing of the prison. We opened the door to the visiting cell, and there on the other side of the glass, Adlita saw her dad for the first time, a paling man in a white jumpsuit, Velcro up the middle, tattoos of letters and numbers and tears down his cheeks, the name of his gang straight across his forehead. He opened his, wide, his arms wide to her, smiling, but in embrace only in gesture. That's all he could offer on his side of the glass. But she just smiled back. She beamed at him, and I saw him beaming back at her. She was shy at first, but as our visit progressed, as Ninas and I talked on the phone, Adelita would crawl up onto the small counter and take the black phone from me. She'd say, Daddy! He'd say, What's up, mamas? She'd say, plainly, I love you. She hadn't even met him before. She didn't judge him. Apparently, she was not afraid of him. His nose started to turn red, his eyes glassy. I'd never seen this in a visit before with him. She was into Justin Bieber at the time. So she held the phone like a tiny pop star, not like this, but like this. And she sang to her dad, pretending to be Selena Gomez. Her voice echoed through the intercom, pouring into the tight space on his side of the glass, soaking him in his daughter's song. Hey, what's that other song again? She turned and whispered to me. She forgot the words again. So I whispered the words in her ear, and she sang to him. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. She whisper, oh yeah, you'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Nina's eyes were now wet. The tattoos blurred under his tears. The pane of glass was apparently gone. Please don't take my sunshine away. That's it. Well, thank you. That's the end of the reading portion of the program. If you guys, um, have some questions. The good news is that uh, Niener's made it out of solitary confinement, and he is on a road trip now with us uh, with, the, with, with the book tour and here to learn from this conference as well. And it's my pleasure to introduce you guys to Niener's. So, um, yeah, we, uh, whatever questions you have can just kind of stir up a uh, conversation. How much time do we have before we should roll out of here, Gabe? Registration starts at 4.30. Okay, so it's like 8, eight, to, 8 to 4. Yeah.
We're not in a rush. Who wants to get us started? Nieners, thank you for being here. What did you think of Chris when you first met him? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody always asks that. Um, I still do to this day. I'm like, man, I tell all the homies, like, this is a dork too white, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge him right away, man. He's a good dude, but he's a dork. <laughs> and they all just laugh. And then we just hang out. He's cool. He, once in a while, I catch him slipping up. He's like, the little goofy man. Be with the homies. You can get a shot. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but he's good. He's a good dude. I thought he was dorky at first, but came clean at the end, you know? So that was 10 years ago. And so Nieners uh, invited me out into, he, he tested me with, with some, some questions. He was like that guy Richard I was telling you about in the, in the beginning. He was uniquely unguarded, and most people have every reason to keep their guards up. So Nieners would call me into his visits. He was the one who often was connecting me to other guys. He was one of the guys that first called me pastor, and I resisted, but he won. And, um, and he invited me out, in, out into the streets. He'd call me at like 1 a.m. and invite me to a gang meeting. I didn't have any friends in the valley. So I got up, put my jeans on, and got in the car and drove out to some, trying to find some address, and walked into the back door of some not too lovely house. And a gang meeting was going on, and he'd introduce me to all these guys, or he'd invite me to a motel in the middle of the night, hanging out with his girlfriend. And it's like he was inviting me into his world as a, as a friend, and it took me a while to name that. And so we became friends, and while I was becoming a pastor, and little did he know he'd want to be a pastor one day, he was really just making me his, his pilot program for what he would <laughs> end up doing one day. So now Nieners is joining us on staff, and is now growing a position as a gang uh, chaplaincy outreach assistant. And he's reaching these guys way better than I ever could. They all look up to him. Other questions? Yeah? I have a question. Um, what, tell us about your daughter and your relationship with her now. She's a teenager. No, she's nine. Oh, she's nine. Oh, I thought it was ten years ago. No. Oh. Uh, when we met. We met nine. ten years ago. I did eight years in prison. I just got out July 20th. I'm still on parole right now. A year ago, like at this time a year ago, I was sitting in solitary confinement. I was in isolation. I got out from isolation. I was sitting in the hole. But um, she was actually with me the night before I, uh, we left. She was still screening the shirts that we brought. She was helping me out. She's my, she's my sidekick, man. She's my shadow. She's with me on everything. When I go cruising, she knows how to throw her seat back to me. <laughs> <laughs> my baby, man. And, um, so I get her one week, and one week her mom gets her. You know, We give her the opportunity. Wherever she wants to go, she goes. And then I'm also single. I'm also raising a. I have a 13 year old daughter that got dropped off on me 45 days after I got out of prison. So that kind of threw me a little. So I had to raise a 13 year old daughter. Tell Chris like, yo, because I was living with Chris like, my dude. <laughs> Gave me all the stuff for my daughter. So we had to give up my room. I slept in the garage, put her in there, and learned how to work with a preteen who just oh, hated me, <laughs> didn't know me flipped me off, did all kinds of crazy stuff, came from a reckless background. And it was just really hard. But we got through it. <coughs> now I like I got I live alone. I have my own place, doing really good, raising my daughters, working my relationships, have another kid on the way. You know, so. so in other words you have a new purpose in life. Oh, most definitely. I, I got a quick question. My frustrations with the Department of Corrections, I'll be personal to admit. Do you feel that the Department of Corrections, not only here in Tennessee, but all over, are focusing on rehabilitation or still on penance? It's crazy, because um, when you get locked up in Washington State, they you go through, like, you go to jail, then you go to receiving place. I don't know if they have that out here in Tennessee. It's called Shelton, and they that's where they categorize you, where you go and what you're doing. So they give you a pamphlet, and it says on the front, we're here to help you rehabilitate so we can reintegrate you into society. Really? They, they have that in print yeah. still? Yeah. Well, I don't know if they still have it. I haven't been in the main line. I'm always in the hall. You know, I never hit these main lines because I'm just too violent for these. It's too vi high violent. So I um, I would read this, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to Monroe. I'm going to chill. I'm going to be out five and a half years. And he knows as well as that how this works out. I ended up shooting from Monroe, and I ended up for like 12 hours away from my town. They shot me way out in Peninsula. And Shot kept me as far away from my family, my support, what I needed to get out. But through the blessing of God and my boy right here, he was constantly at those visits, constantly trying to keep that money orders coming to 
I mean, a lot of deep stuff is just really deep. And I, it's just. Tell them about your, uh, your current parole officer. Oh, man, it's like, I got out of parole. I'm not on parole right now. And, uh, she, uh, she was, she was really mean to him. She didn't want him to, at all. She didn't want to work with the support group that I was working with. She's like, nah, she was shooting him down and everything. She didn't down on this trip, even before I even, she even met me. When she met me, she was cool, man. <laughs> she was a blast. She was all like, I'm about you, da 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 da. She didn't like him. She, she didn't like, no, he's hustling you. He's doing all these things and this and i like, nah, nah, he's cool. This is my dude and shit. But she still doesn't give him the chance, but she's really, like, she's about it. She tells him straightforward, like, you know, they want you back in the system. They want you to do this. This is what they, she's always been there for me and stuff. And, I respect her, you know. And there's some officers in the prison system that I do give the respect or give you that common, you know, you give them common respect, they give it back. But then the, you got the ones that actually run for the Department of Corrections and want to just recycle you through the whole system and stuff. So it's sad. It's sad we have a system like that when, in a world like this. I found that there's individuals as I've tried to, I mean, Nuners is just going to take me on a wild goose chase throughout the entire state's Department of uh, Corrections. Because I'm not ordained, I don't have pastor privileges to visit anyone, so I'm just like a normal civilian that has, can have beyond one inmate's visiting list at a time. And so there's so many guys that meet in the, meet in the county jail that go off to prisons that I can't visit them, because I'm on Jose Israel Garcia's visiting list. And so that since they'd ship him all around, I had to travel around, so he took me on a tour throughout all the prisons. And every single facility was st just starting from the bottom of just trying to get a basic visit going. Um, and some individuals were cool. But most of the time, it's just a, a, a really sick system. I see so much potential. That's the frustrating thing. In the system or in the men and women? Both. Okay. Uh, both. Mm -hmm. The men. Uh, working with uh, the, the guys at the Barry. Guys, these guys, a lot of these guys are just, they know they did wrong, but they have the potential to really do great things, given the opportunity even within the confinements of the prison. But it seems like the prison is I'm not sure they really want them to succeed. That's a harsh card comment. No, I think you're right. I think you'll hear much stronger statements than that at this conference. <laughs> right? Yeah. You'll be in good company with questions like that. Other questions? Comments? Memories? Andrew? Yeah, um, uh, like guys locked up. Guys who are even guys who are in the, the future. In the yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, as far as like some of the ethics of writing right. and creative nonfiction, absolutely. Like I, I sent drafts of every chapter to anyone who was in it. Um, was changing, you know, following all the ethical rules of a, of a creative nonfiction, changing names, changing uh, identifiable characteristics. But what was really interesting? Oh man, I'm gonna read this this page for you. One of the guys, Richard, who I told you about at the beginning. Stay up here with us. Um, oh, all right. Um, uh, I had an interaction with him that I put at the very end of the book because it's as I've done so much creative nonfiction dialogues, I realize that we're, I'm in a really unique situation with some guys in prison. And I think what Richard vocalizes here might be um, similar to other inmates and in that maybe there's a different ethic for storytelling for some folks who are locked up than like my friend who's a doctor who, who was horrified by what I was doing. Um, late one night I was visiting Richard one-on-one -on -one through the glass at the county jail he was, before he was shipped off to a prison and rotted alone. But after the no-touch policy had moved us out of the small visiting rooms where we'd begun our friendship. I was scribbling down in my small notebook things he said, connections that occurred to me as he spoke with a black phone pinched between my ear and shoulder. But I noticed his silence, waiting for me to finish transcribing. Hey, what are you going to do with all that, which you write down? I told him it was mainly for my own education as a young chaplain, to make me a better minister. As a student, I learned how to take notes, I said, and now you're one of my professors. Judged by his change of posture, I could tell Richard rather liked this arrangement. Most of the time, though, I told him, I, I just loved what he said. I take note of beauty. So you're going to write a book on all his homies one day or what? shrugged and confessed it was a pipe dream I'd always had to write maybe one day. Oh, but don't worry, I assured. If I ever write for the public and want to use something you've shared with me, 
I'll change your name, disguise you in some way. His eyes narrowed. And I'll have you read it over and approve anything before it goes out. I mean, I know this stuff. All you tell me, this is sensitive material. Richard looked offended. I got nothing to hide. He cocked his head to the side. I'm a bad guy, Chris. Criminal, big fucking surprise. That's all most people know about people like me. They throw us away and we're forgotten, like we never even existed. So why would I want to be disguised? They never even see us anyway. But you, <coughs> and he pointed his finger through the glass, you see us. So I'm telling you, you better write a book about me, Chris. You tell the world everything you know about me. I wrote this down too. And you better not change my name, motherfucker. <laughs> when I looked up, he was grinning, grinning at me through the glass. Faint in the glare, just beside Richard's face, I saw my own reflection, smiling now as well. We were looking at each other, of course, but for a glowing moment, I saw a portrait, the only one I have of us. So there's conversations like that that um, informed a lot of this. So so many guys wrote back and I thought, yeah, this shit's tight, this is this. No, I didn't have that offense. Um, yeah, that's true, what you wrote about my baby's mama. And why'd you change my name? Tyler, Taylor, what the hell is that? Write my name. <laughs> um, and so I, that really surprised me that so many folks who already feel like uh, totally invisible, unwanted, thrown away in the trash, to be able to have their life celebrated, um, I think it's different than some of us have the privilege of the details of our lives being known or not. They really want to be seen. What do you think? I mean, what, I mean Niners, you were the first, one of the main ones. I'm just like, I'm changing your name, man. And you were just like, why? You want to say more about that? You're Having your story in, in here? Just, uh, I, like the whole time growing up, I always wanted people to see what, what, what's the real, what really is out there. Not what you gotta get fat. We had to, we didn't even have a plastic spoon, let alone a silver one, you know, so, like, I want you guys to see the realness, what's really in society, what's really messing up our people out here, whether you're white, black, Mexican, or whatever color, race you are, what's really messing us up. <coughs> But other stuff out here that kind of goes with it. So um, I told him, like, man, my dude, you got to put my name on this shit. Like, I want people to know the truth. I don't want people to be like, yo, who's this guy? Uh, I don't know what name he gave me. Probably some funky one or something. But um, I was like, nah, man, this is me. <laughs> so, yeah, it was cool, man. It was really, I really respect that he did that for us and stuff. And my boy Joe, trust in peace, man. He, that's my dude, man. It's sad what happened to him. But I know he would have been the same way right here, right now, when he's telling you guys the same thing. Like, yo, we want them to know about what's happening. Why we live in a four-block radius? Why we can't leave this little area? Why we never get to be up here? And even if we do, we still can't live with these people. It's, it sucks, you know? Yeah. And so, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was tricky. There's a lot of people in the book. And I, I took a, a large part of the advance and, and broke it up and shared it with different people or asked how to honor the, the memory of some of them who had died. Um, but yeah, the, the only people that have been offended are people who aren't even in the book. And who I've been told are the, the ones who are getting all, like, like cousins of Richard in the beginning who feel offended about the family. And who I've been told are really just, they want money as well in a lawsuit. And so, um, and then I felt really bad, like, oh no, I really did make a mistake. And so many of the other family members have come out and be like, no, nah, the way you told it is totally right. They're just pissed off and they want money out of this. So, yeah. Yeah, I came today, so um, the ones that passed away, would they, would that do to like the street life? Would they just would you make it or say some of the guys passed away that you're talking about? Yeah, I'd love it if you buy the book and you'll hear the whole stories. <laughs> but one of them, though, um, and the, the stories are, are they're horrible. They're, they're horror stories. That one of them, that guy Richard I was talking about at the beginning, I don't know if you missed that part, he, um, he rotted to death uh, in prison. In prison. In a, in a first world prison, he rotted to death at age 26, being in their care for less than a year of a preventable um, flesh-eating disease. Um, another one was shot down in broad daylight by federal marshals while he rode away from them on a small bicycle. Um, and so... Um, they probably felt threatened. Yeah, well, we, the, the part of that chapter, it's called Fuck the World, actually. <laughs> and it, the guy, guy had that tattooed on his neck. And so it's just kind of like an extended meditation on his neck. And, and what that has to do with a lot of the New Testament letters that say something similar, that they don't use the F word. They do have a, a polemic against something they call the world. First of all, man, I love your shirt. I gotta give me one just for you. <laughs> 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 you know, I love that thing. Uh, you know, um, I'm just curious, what is your future looking like, man? You're out of jail. What, is your, what do you think your opportunities are? What are the choices 
that you feel as though or changes that you need to make that you're going to be allowed to make? How, you know, is this stuff going to be, because now that you're involved with this to some degree, I wonder if it's going to make your transition a little bit better or, or not as far as, you know, getting a job and, uh, and stuff like that. And I also want to know, did you ever speak to like um, schools or anything like that? You know, I'm a uh, substitute teacher and I work with kids every day. And you know, uh, I was with some kids yesterday and trying to explain some, and I can see some of them headed toward that way, you know? And I feel myself very lucky because, uh, uh, you know, one of the, but they're, they're great. I love working with kids. One of them, you know, I'm, me I'm black and Mexican. So one of them said, well, Mr. Luan, you're a black -sican. So black. now when they see me, they write, they call me. But you know, I like that because I think, you know, you're right about those kids in that life. Some of, a lot of those kids go home and go hungry. I've seen them, a lot of them, uh, we were talking about Hernandez, who got convicted, and a lot of the girls were just going, oh, he's so good looking, he couldn't do anything bad. And one of the guys was trying to defend him, and I wonder about this, about trying to let them know about making choices, you know, at 12 years old, because, uh, you know, some of these girls I know are going to be pregnant in two or three years. I mean, you got people, women under 30 years and old, with 12 year old kids. And I'm just curious, you're coming from that. And I wonder, do you have any plans or, you know, to try to, I don't know, to touch them, yeah. to try to tell them, hey, listen, I'm from, you know, because that's what they need more like. People who have that, uh, who've been there and can tell them. Because, you know, you know, some people tell me they think, you know, they just can't relate to it. But someone who's been there, and stuff like that, and I just wonder if you have any plans. I know there's a lot of questions. Yeah, most there, definitely, but. dude. Like, like, um, I uh, I grew up with the uh, chances only favor prepared mind, you know. So right. I always come prepared for something, you know. When every chance opportunity or any arises, my I'm gonna hit it, whether whatever, you know. And I've always even in, when I was in the bed, I was always like that, you know. Coming from the streets, I had to grind to get up ahead. So um, now I'm uh, actually. I go to schools in many now. Yeah, I'm actually with the. Uh, Working with the gang ministry, I'm assistant to the gang chaplain to him and stuff, you know, and I'm trying to raise the, uh, support for that. So I've been working with some little juveniles, uh, 14 and 15 year old uh, kids with trouble, man. I'm, I met the kid in the, I accidentally went to the wrong court, met the dude, boom, been speaking to him, been working with him. Boy hasn't been locked up, his brother hasn't been locked up. They're both about to get off probation. One of them gets off probation today as we speak, the other one got off a week ago. Been doing marvelous, both in school, getting more credits, getting more action, more classes, doing good. We also speak to other people, to older folks and stuff. I speak to a lot of my homies from my hood, you know, that are still in the block, still gang banged out. I still speak to them and I tell them, yo, like, my dude, you guys know I'm doing good and stuff. And they, they, were, they were respected. Like, I've had some of them slip up, like, carry pistols while they drive with me, which I don't know. But when I do, I'm like, yo, I can't have that. You know, I'm on my second strike. I got my little babies at home. I can't have this happen. So that's my biggest thing. Like, right now, it's, it's just amazing you said that because this morning, me and my boy right here, we're just talking about a schedule and stuff, and we're trying to plan it all out because we have other people, like other juvenile halls where we want to hit, you know, and uh, jails. My city, they still don't believe it, you know, just like anybody else. They don't believe the changes and stuff, you know. They still want to be like, nah, I'm cool with that fool ain't changing. He's just faking the funk, you know. So they won't let me in certain schools. Certain schools then trespass me. Certain places then cut me off. But there's teachers that have been like, yo, we want you here, and then have pushed forward on that. So I've been on it, you know? And I've been on the grind of trying to help all these homes. And that's my main, like, at the top of it, I'm not trying to be in no office, no no job, no, no. I want to be on the streets, man, where it needs to be, you know, where, the, where it needs to really be at. And that's one of the main things we're doing on this tour. It's, <clears throat> it's awesome if folks want to buy uh, books where we'll be at the book signing uh, table shortly after this. I think it's right upstairs with the other books. Um, and we've got some T-shirts. Uh, Nina's had an idea while well, he was in the hole of a shirt called Hugs for Thugs. And so that's kind of our, our, one of our little fundraisers, like our Girl Scout cookies, to support what we do. But more directly, as we create a position for Niners, who's had this not only a unique transformation in his story, but even more unique in my 10 years of this, that wants to join the mission and wants to come on staff with us at Tierra Nueva. And his first month or two out of prison, still barely getting on his feet, he made more positive contact with active gang members in our valley than I have as like a you know, career chaplain uh, than I'd have in maybe a year. And so I'm really trying to put all my energy into helping uh, Niener's fundraise to create a position the way uh, missionaries do, like speaking to families and individuals and homes who want to join a monthly support team. And I used to be ashamed of that. I thought, man, we got to get a big board and get some more grants, and I don't have to do this low-level, shameful fundraising. But I've come full circle, and I think it's awesome, as I see a lot of my friends like, lose their positions that they're passionate about because a grant dries up. But there's something very grassroots and very relational about people, just almost like uh, direct uh, farm to, to market 
uh, groceries or like a CSA, like a relationship going straight between uh, grassroots workers on the margins and families that be like, hey, we want to join your support team, $25, $50 a month, something like that. Whether that's your tithing or whether that's um, your charitable giving that's very relational, there's very little overhead. If that's something that you feel you want to do, just hearing the story, if you want to get to know more about what we do, we'd love to, to jump you in and join our support team so that Nieners can do this full time and we can both travel and speak, put time in on the streets, and maybe there's three more guys coming out of solitary who want to join us in the next two years. We want to build that movement. So we'll be, out, we'll be upstairs if you want to talk. There's books if you want to join uh, uh, our support team. If you want to just grab a t-shirt, we also have a small coffee roasting uh, business called Underground Coffee, which we started a few years ago to give us a small supplemental income to guys doing their treatment, kind of coming out of the underground. Um, and so we have just a little bit of that coffee upstairs. Yeah, I'll just give a little direction. Some of you came from upstairs. If you didn't, as you go up here, the table's right there, t-shirts, coffees. T-shirts, coffee, and then the cards. And, yep. and then you go straight across up the stairs, take a left on your way out. Registration will be on your right. And the most important part, all the books will be across the hall from registration. Barnes & Noble set up, credit card swipe, however you want to do it. They're ready to sell. Awesome. Any other questions before we migrate upstairs? One last closer. Question you were just sitting on, it's itching you. Your heart's racing. You're like, do I ask it? Do I ask it? Do I ask it? No? All right. We'll see you guys in just a little bit. Thank you so much. <laughs>